morning, brothers and sisters. Yeah, this is such a introduction to a tour that we all expect because I think uh, city people really longs for a uh, retreat. And so let's pray before we uh, receive the word of God. Father God, as the deer panda for the waters, our soul panda for you. And so we come close to you, and as you promise, you stay close to us. And we ask that your word will renew us, will rejuvenate our souls to walk closely and to walk in your will. And so we ask that we set apart our hearts and empty our hearts so that we can receive your word humbly. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Today we shall continue with what I left off last time. The last time I was here was late April, which you probably forgot. And I, we talk about the Servant Diary, Part 1, on uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3 through 13. Now it's the turn for Servant, sermon di uh, servant Diary, Part 2, from the, uh, the text of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 through 7, verse 1. <coughs> Oops. Yeah, uh, last week... Me and uh, several senior pastors from this church, we went to Kaohsiung for a three days small group training. And it was a very intensive training. It's three days, but it's nine to nine. And we listened to 20 sermons in three days. It was like, it was very tiring and yet very refreshing. And we, we are very motivated. It's a very hectic daily training schedule. And it refreshes us a lot with a single-minded purpose of spreading the gospel through small church. I mean, sm small groups as church mission, as in our individual life missions. And so, you know, after such a hectic schedule, what do you expect when you go back to your hotel room? Especially when you place the card saying, make up my room. What do you look for in the hotel room after such hectic daily schedule when you return back to the room? in the evening or in general when you go on vacation or go on business trip what do you expect when you check into a hotel room I think the minimal that you want would be a clean up room right with clean bed sheet well tucked in clean the glasses replace the free bottles of water right replace the clean towels right wipe the uh, desk and bathroom counter and whatnot is that too much to expect no, because you pay for it, right? Well, but then what would be your, what would you, uh, be your response when you hold up the glass and try to take a thirsty sip only to find out there's an unknown source of lipstick mark on it? Ah! <laughs> then you start to feel like me, right? Okay. How would you feel when you open up the new bed sheets only to find out there are stains marks underneath it? No. Imagine this gross feeling of uncleanliness to go beyond a hotel room. Now, I went for an um, annual medical checkup. Now, tell me what if you find out the medical tools at the doctor's clinic were all filthy and dirty before they applied to you. Whoa, would you want that? No, nobody want that, okay? Gratefully, we still have our Apostle Paul leaving behind for us his servant diary as our reference and as an example for all who follow Jesus faithfully as he laid out his defense, his life, his ministry, and his integrity along these lines in uh, chapter 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 7 1. Last time we find out how coarse or difficult faring or ministry path have shaped God's servant. Today we shall look into this second part of Paul's defense among the Corinthians, tracing God's formation of his servants in forging steadfast holiness for his servants. So the whole theme for this uh, sermon will be steadfast holiness as proven God, uh, God's vessels. And we have it divided into three parts. A, verse 14 through 16a, proof of sacredness. Let's read the verse together, okay? Start from verse 14, go. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony as Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? 
For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. Okay. After the exhortation to the congregation about course faring as proven God's servant, Paul went on to establish believers' steadfast stance in holiness in the midst of the wicked and immoral generation in those Roman days and in the city of Corinth. Backing up what he has taught them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 through 3 about their carnal status, about their carnal spirituality, and the immoral deeds derived from there. Using God's temple as a figure of speech, God exhorted, uh, Paul exhorted believers to live up a life as sacred as like what God's holy temple should be. There are six contrasts or incompatibilities here cited within the text. There are five contrasts within verse 14 through 15, which is on this page. Can you count that for me, the five contrasts, which is believers versus unbelievers, righteousness versus lawlessness, light versus darkness, Christ versus Belial, which means not, not profitable, and the last, believers versus unbelievers. And in verse 16a, the the sixth contrast, temple of God versus idols. Here in the text, the incompatibility issues fell more likely to be on marriages and business partnership among believers and unbelievers back in those days. Reverend Spurgeon has once taught a sister about this truth. He asked his sister to stand up on a high table and ask her to attempt pulling him up from the ground. And guess what? The effort was useless. The effort was futile. Indeed, it was much easier for Reverend Spurgeon on the ground to pull her down from the table. And so he concludes. Likewise, he makes the point by saying that it is almost impossible to attempt bringing an unbeliever partner from the ground up to the believer's kingdom on the high table. And you, can st you and I can still recall Jesus' anguish pushing off those traders who did money business inside the temple. And Paul here is warning the believers in staying away from idol worships or related activities during his days so believers would not be stained or swayed by idols as the history of Israel gravely depicted. Let's read this quotation together. One of the truest tasks of integrity is its blunt refusal to be compromised. Were we not aware of the many fake products these days within this world of money and fame? Any one of you are carrying some fake luxury goods right now? Show me your, you know, A4. <laughs> okay, and let me know where you can buy it, you know. No, we, we, we don't go for that, right? right? Fake luxury goods, fake medicines, fake certificates, and fake testimony and whatnot. We do refuse and abhor those existences, and we often judge them as illegal, damaging, and deserve confiscation and severe penalties, right? In the same way, God desires us to be as pure and as sacred as his holy temple is always. He certainly refused to see us walking on earth as phony Christians, misrepresenting his glorious name. So we should ask, how does it look like when Christian becomes unholy and unsacred these days? It shows up when our unchristian character is smelling stinky at workplace and within our family. It shows up in our lukewarm attitude in attending church and in serving God at church. It shows up in our compromised failures in involving in premarital sex and extramarital affairs and addictions of all sorts, in our world, and also in our worldly ways of doing business and relating to people and whatnot. That even our unbelievers' friends and family members would consider us as stinky Christians, smelly and unsacred and it blocks many others into the kingdom of God. In short, brethren, make the right choice of salvaging our integrity before God and in the midst of this fallen and idol's rich world so that we can be proven as God's vessels by the many proofs of sacredness, the choice of sacredness that we make in our daily lives through God's grace and mercy. To help you remember how to apply God's word, sacred, holy, the word holy in the Old Testament means set apart. Set apart means reserved for God only. That means we need to give God the highest priority above all else. If you have talents, if you have time, if you have treasure for everything else, God is asking you to set aside all those stuff for God alone. 
if you have extra time that you spend, you can spend on vacation, you have extra money that you can spend on other stuff, God is asking, would you be willing to give it up for me to reserve all the best that you have for God and God alone? You know, these days, we all <coughs> favor reputations and fames, right? Anyone, any one of you have your name cards, your business name card with you right now? Because you don't see a need to show off in church, right? Definitely, right? I agree. But a lot of us actually bring along your, your you know, fanciful you know, name card, and there is a whole list of your reputations, front and back. <coughs> but is that really that precious? Is that really that valuable in the, in the eyes of God? Are you willing to give up your titles, your reputations, your talents, all reserved for God alone? And I can tell you for real, all through histories, God has reserved his very best people, talented people, bankers, educators, you know, spiritual leaders, all over the world, across histories. God reserved all these people for his kingdom alone because these people would rather forsake worldly reputation and treasure their name being remembered by God. And this is what, mean, what is meant by choosing sacredness in our lives, okay? Second, second, po- second part, verse 16b through 18, proof of belongingness. Let's start reading the verse. I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Here Paul cited three Old Testament passages depicting God's progressive mercies and promises to bring his people back to his side throughout, the history, throughout their history of frailty, weaknesses, and weightwardness. In verse 16b, God says, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This wonderful promise of God's presence and indwelling was from Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 11 through 12, as God offered to the Israelites as they left Egypt and entered into the land of Canaan, assuring them of his providence, protection, and guidance, wishing them to live a good life, to live a new, brand new life of free freedom, a separate holy lifestyle among the Gentiles. But as we know from history, unfortunately, Israelites failed gravely and entered into another form of slavery within the Canaanites' world, resulting in mixed religions, religious adultery, mixed marriages, and fornications of all kinds. Isn't that our modern Christianity lifestyles often resembles? What do you think non-believers in this world sees Christianity? Our just as weak, broken Christian homes and marriages, our just as vulnerable premarital sex and affairs after our sacred weddings in the church, and our diluted moral standards in the midst of all forms of lies and twisted worldviews. May our Lord's original calling for us to genuine freedom from sin continue to draw us ever closer to Him as we struggle in the spirit to thrive about these earthly battles. In verse 17, this verse was taken from Isaiah 52, 11, and Ezekiel 20, 34, 41. It reminds us of God's great mercy towards the wayward Israelites. The further away they, they stray from God, the greater mercies God is showering on them, expressing God's warm welcome should they choose to return to God and abstain from uncleanliness. And, and in verse 18, this verse was taken from 2 Samuel chapter 7, 14, 27, and Isaiah 43, 6. This depicts God's great parental mercies with open arms to call upon all of us to call upon his repentant sons and daughters to where they should belong. <coughs> we belong to God. But God knows way ahead that we are like, we are even worse than furry animals. I'm going to cite that example to you that we don't treasure the opportunity to return to God's house. And after we return to God's house, we go outside and become dirty pigs again. And that's, that's the way we live our Christian life, okay? Let's read these quotations together. When God promises, he's not saying, I'll try. 
He means I can and I will. He can and he will bring us back even further, even as further as you will want to stray away from God. How assuring and how promising of God to be our eternal King and Father to whom we should belong and should pledge so allegiance. Anyone uh, kind of like watch that uh, TV series from Japan? It's called Chongma Dai Ying, you know, the base camp of, uh, you know, straight animals. No? You should watch it sometimes, okay? And I watched it again last night, okay? It was, it was just eye-tearing, okay? Anyone heard of and read about those straight animal stories? Those contrast pictures of their horrible before, you know, like shot eye, red shot eyes, you know, and like all dirty hairs and everything. It's those horrible before pictures. And those blessed after pictures of those straight animals, after they're being adopted, you know, okay? If you, if you can picture those contrasts, okay? Truly and behold, all strayed animals, once well domesticated, they will treasure the loving kindness of their new masters and look and behave completely different. They start to feel the security, they will look beloved, and they start to become very obedient in their new homes. Because why? They find a new heaven. Like, they find a new heaven-like belongingness in their new homes and with the new masters. Now, in contrast, how unfortunate that we Christians are often so much more unteachable and continue with our wayward beings and lifestyle after trusting Jesus our Lord. Now, you may ask, how can you and I know and non-believers know that we belong to God? By the way we dress? I don't think so. We dress pretty much like they do. You know. By living out our Christian life far better than those adopted straight furry animals. How so? By showing greater contentment in God. By showing greater thankfulness in God. By showing greater servanthood and obedience to our new master, Jesus Christ our Lord. In short, brethren, make the right choice of choosing our belongingness to God alone in the midst of this perverted and temptation-rich generation so that we can be proven as God's vessel by the many proofs of belongingness in our lives through God's grace and mercy. The last point, proof of cleanliness. Let's read chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Paul decidedly concludes his defense passage for his life, ministry, and his integrity in a mutual exhortation for all believers to choose cleanliness of life that is, free from all defilement of flesh and the spirit, while perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I think it agrees with the following quotes that reminds us that holiness is always a choice. This PowerPoint page cited two uh, biblical uh, examples. Joseph, when facing temptation, he ran away. He flee temptation. He learned how to sprint before temptation. And it also cited Daniel. He ran after holiness in the, in the risk of being burned inside a furnace. And he knows how to, he demonstrate what it means as running after this holiness marathon. So holiness is a lifetime choice. Either you run away or abstain from all temptation and sins, or else all temptation and sins will run after you and stain you inside out. And so I think the most proactive response is to run away from all sins and temptations while we run after God and his kingdom business. Agree? Agree? You guys sound to be very silent and this sermon is about to end. <laughs> but I believe God's word sings in your hearts, okay? I can speak no further than God's words. In conclusion, May our Lord write on our servant's diary as we reflect and commit to A. Pursue proof of sacredness. That means we learn from compromise to standing strong. We learn to, to go from unbelief to belief. We learn to choose unrighteousness to righteousness. We learn to choose from darkness to light. We learn to stay away from pleasures and sins to genuine repentance. And may our lives reflect the sacredness of God's holy temple. B. Live out proof of belongingness. 
May our life show that we choose from the wilderness to Canaan, from being the prodigal son to being his beloved. May our lives reflect the sweet belongness to our Lord, that this world will recognize be and, and be attracted to join us and his kingdom. And last but not least, we learn to display proof of cleanliness. From all history's examples to our daily choice of holiness, may our lives reflect cleanliness of soul in the fear of God. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you and bless your holy name as you call upon us, each one of our names, and draw us into your kingdom. And Father God, we treasure your, your sense of goodness and your forever mercy as you draw us from the depths of sins that we were in and free us to bring us into this eternal light, the eternal kingdom of you, and help us to live out as a kingdom's people and help us to live up as your beloved sons and daughters that we choose sacredness, that we choose belongingness, and we choose cleanliness in our daily lives, daily routines that other people can recognize we truly belong to you and be attracted to join us and into your kingdom. And so as we close by singing our response hymn, The Servant King, may you guide us and teach our hearts to devote our very best and our very all to follow the footstep of our servant king, Jesus our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.